What's up, ODs and eyewear lovers? We're talking the latest trends in tech and eye care. So sit back, relax, and defocus. Greetings, colleagues, and welcome to the Defocus Media Podcast. It's your favorite optometrist, Dr. Daryl Glover. And today I'm hanging out with my favorite optometrist, Dr. Jennifer Lyerly. And today we're going to talk about a topic that is real hot in the exam room, blue light. I am a big fan when it comes to blue light protection. And recently, when I was on LinkedIn, I came across a video that was talking about blue light. And the young man that was talking about blue light, you could clearly tell that he was passionate about it. He loved blue light protection, and he really wanted to educate the world about the importance of blue light protection. Friends and family, I have a scientist with us today, Dr. Shelby Temple. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Temple, would you mind sharing a little bit about your background in vision science and how you got into blue light research? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm a visual neuroscientist. I've spent the past 20 years or so investigating how light interacts with molecules in our eye uh, so that it provides us with vision or, or other aspects of protecting our eyes. And I've used sort of animal and human models to look into that. And over the past, oh, I, I guess about maybe 10 years ago, I've started working on octopus and cuttlefish of all things, and they don't see the color of light like we do. They see the polarization. So instead of the wavelength, they see the orientations of those waves as they travel through space. And in order to test their vision, I had to create interesting devices that would present them with polarized stimuli. And in the process of doing that, I noticed that I could actually see some of these patterns and our humans aren't well known for seeing polarized light. So I started looking into why it was that humans see polarized light. And it turns out that little molecules in our eyes that happen to be there in part to block the blue light that gets to our retina, um, we're allowing humans to see polarized light. So that's kind of spurred my interest in exploring more, you know, why do we have these molecules that block blue light in our retina? And uh, and what are they doing there? And are they important in protecting the retina? And what role does blue light really play in long-term retinal damage? Well, that is the money topic when we talk about blue light discussions in eye care right now. So, I mean, I want to pick your brain on this a little bit because when we discuss the dangers of blue light to the retina, most of the scientific studies showing that possible photochemical damage to retinal cell tissue from blue light exposure is in animal models and under very high concentrations of blue light exposure, not looking at humans under computer or cell phone exposure. Do you feel that there's enough scientific evidence to say that human eyes could be damaged from a daily amount of blue light exposure from just daily device use? Uh, so there's a lot in that question. And I think, so I'll, I'll answer it with a short answer first, and then I'm going to go into more detail. So the short answer is that on their own, uh, individual devices probably aren't putting out a super high amounts of energy that, you know, that they're going to cause damage immediately or any time, any short term period. Um, but on the long term, that's where we're that's what we're interested in, and it's not about the intensity so much as the exposure. And there's a lot of stuff out there that we don't know about with respect to our exposure. So the distances people are using the devices, how dilated their pupils are, uh, and how long they're using for. That's that's the really big thing. So I want to break down your question maybe and look at it from a couple of different perspectives. So you mentioned animals in that, and I think a lot of authorities and, and people doing research reviews will often look at the quickly discount. The validity of animal research. And I think, first off, that's it's really important that we not do that. Um, animals provide us with a model, allows us to do testing that we can't do on humans. So, you know, the study that the authorities and governing bodies would like to see is a controlled, placebo controlled study on humans that proves that either blue light itself or blocking blue light either damages or doesn't damage the retina and cause, say, age related macular degeneration. But if you think about what that study would look like, you're talking about probably a 65 year study before you get enough of the participants to actually get AMD. And you need to start it when these children are really, really young and control that through their entire lives. Clearly, this is not feasible. Um, it's, and it's never going to happen. So we won't have that type of evidence. But what we can do is do animal studies on cells, tissues, and these have all been done on whole animals, and we can look at epidemiological studies in humans. And consistently, all of these studies show that without question, blue light is dangerous. That's well established. But your question is, is there enough uh, intensity from digital devices to cause damage? And I think that's the next part of the question. It's not about intensity. It's about exposure, as I mentioned. So yes, absolutely. If you hold your phone up to the blue sky, you can see it's not nearly as bright as a blue sky. The intensity is about an order of magnitude less. But you wouldn't sit outside and look at a blue sky for hours on end. 
Um, and in fact, people that have, sure enough, within months have had retinal, de uh, retinal degeneration of, of different types. So military people looking for planes, for example, um, studies showed that those people were, were at much higher risk of retinal damage. So if, if and, and we wouldn't do that now. So if you're looking at your phone, your computer for hours on end uh, and your pupils are dilated, you're letting an order of magnitude more light into your retina. And what we don't know is what the long term effects of that are going to be. And, and children, as you probably are aware now, are sitting there playing with tablets at the age of three already. And they're now going to be interacting with these devices for their entire lives. So on their own, short-term use, not a problem. Long-term use throughout life, that's where it's really, we're doing the experiment now to know what's actually going to happen. And as I say, it's, it's difficult because it's about exposure, not intensity. So you can't simplify it down to, oh, well, the intensity is low. I could go into a little more detail about this exposure thing and intensity. And it's a bit like if you had, if you were in a boat and you had, you know, a couple tiny pinpricks in the boat and they were leaking slowly over time. Eventually, it's still going to sink your boat. Um, but if the holes were bigger, it would sink it faster. And so that's that sort of accumulation of damage through life in your retina. Up till now, people have been getting sort of, if you look at the proportions, up to about 15 to 20 percent of people will have uh, AMD by the time they're 65. But many of us now are living much, much longer than that. And the percentages increase exponentially with every year you go past 65 years of age. So the really the trick then is to, to delay onset. And everything we're doing that's exposing us to more blue light is adding to that uh, increasing rate of onset. So let's talk about that. What can we do to delay the onset? I mean, us as eye care professionals, we have our, you know, bag of tricks that we discuss with our patients from um, you know, sunglasses to vitamins, leafy green vegetables, you know, all that jazz in general. But with you out there really doing that research, let's talk about some of the things that, that you know about. Yeah, I mean, I think really it's, it's, a, it's a combination of everything. People need to be more aware. They need to understand. Um, so they need to be, first off, they need to be educated. They need to understand what the dangers are. And it's not that, you know, you go outside for 10 minutes and, oh, that's it, you're going to get AMD. It's not like that. Uh, every time you go out and expose yourself, it's like playing the lottery. And the more you play, the more likely you're one day to win. It's the same with this. You know, blue light, you're going to get so much exposure through your life. And if you're at the higher levels exposure, epidemiological studies have shown that you're more likely to get AMD. So uh, people that work on the water, for example, are more likely to get AMD. But there's a whole bunch of other known risk factors, modifiable risk factors that you can, as, as an IK professional, make recommendations and, and provide products in that space. So you're absolutely right. First off, you know, a good pair of sunglasses, absolutely required for everybody. But some people need them more than others. And that relates to another modifiable thing, which is these macular pigments in their retina. So people that have low levels of macular pigments are at greater risk because their natural sunglasses that sit the back of their retina are, are poor. And so they need to be doing more to protect themselves. And that's where things like blue light filtering lenses or coatings come in. Um, you know, they add another level of protection, another 20 to 30 percent reduction in the amount of blue light getting to the retina is going to help through life. So that uh, hat's really important. And as you say, eating well, super important in that case, because that's where you get these carotenoids, these macular pigments from. They only come from your diet. So if you're not getting enough dark uh, leafy greens and brightly colored fruits and veg, you're not replenishing your macular pigments. They're decreasing and you're at greater risk. And these macular pigments will block uh, up to 80% of the blue light before it gets to your retina, which is absolutely wow. critical. So one of the parts of prescribing for our patient's protection you mentioned was blue light filtering glasses. And the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, has actually created a report to establish standards for blue light filtering lenses. What does this report indicate is the wavelength of light that specifically we should be filtering with blue light protection. Yeah, so it, it, the statement actually, that report is um, just came out, uh, I think last uh, November, uh, not 2019, but 2018. And they state that solar radiation is a significant hazard to the retina in the wavelength range of 380 to 500. But then they go on to qualify that. So we're talking violet blue really. But they qualify that by saying, actually, a level of damage by a wavelength decreases. So the amount of energy per wavelength decreases. Uh, as you go higher in wavelength. And the benefits of blue light in the longer wavelengths, particularly for setting our circadian sleep wait cycle, outweigh the dangers. Um, and on top of that, you have these macular pigments that help to block them. So what they're suggesting is that really we need to be concerned with 380 to 455 nanometers. That's the critical part. That's the short, short end of things. So right down by the ultraviolet violet and blue is what they're saying we, we need to be more conscious of and we need to be putting in place some way of, of reducing that 
you know, getting to our eyes and to our retina in particular. I think this is so interesting because sometimes I will have, um, even in uh, patient care. So Daryl and I, when we're in, uh, when Daryl's in North Carolina, we practice in a very highly scientific community in North Carolina. And I will have patients when I talk about blue filtering lenses because they're doing heavy research, heavy computer use, counter me with saying, well, I've read about upsetting my sleep cycles or maybe causing depression or mood changes if I'm blocking blue. So I don't want to wear anything that's going to potentially make um, my sleep cycles or my mood unstable. And so having that conversation where we talk about, well, we're filtering very specific wavelengths that won't upset those parts. When you're talking to someone that's a little bit more informed about this topic, it's very useful to have the wavelengths defined. Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, that's really the key. I mean, people get concerned about this. And they even talk about it for intraocular lens replacement, uh, IOLs. Um, you know, that people say, oh, you shouldn't put the, the, the blue filtering ones in because it, it'll upset their color vision and their sleep cycles. And it's completely ridiculous because, in fact, ophthalmologists are taking out a lens that's already yellowed with age and they're putting hopefully one in that matches, right? So it's the right thing to do. Um, a lot of ophthalmologists, I've actually asked them, I said, why don't you use the blue ones? Because sometimes they don't. And they'll say, oh, we really like the reaction of our patients when they go, oh, I can see all the colors so well again. But evidence suggests that a lot of these patients go on to get AMD within about five years after having their IOLs. So, you know, that puts that into context. Back to your question, though, about, you know, the sleep-wake cycle. The other side of that is that really to optimize your sleep-wake cycle, you just need to be exposed to um, bright light with some blue, ideally outdoors, uh, shortly after you first wake up. And if you do that, you set your circadian clock and everything's fine. And anything else you do is almost irrelevant after that. So, you know, for me, I get up and go for a run or a walk, uh, I walk to work. Um, that's enough light early in the day to set that cycle. And after that, putting on my blue filtering lens coatings, which I'm wearing right now, it's not going to interfere with that. You're going to get plenty of blue light, more than you need, uh, and certainly in the range that you need. So the 480 nanometers is the peak sensitivity for melanopsin, and that's where it needs to be. And, and these lenses are not blocking up that end. Yeah, Jim, you know, you, you bring up a great point. I mean, whenever I have this conversation or dialogue with my patients, you know, they're always coming in, uh, you know, well, well, I use this to my advantage in a way. Whenever patients come in and they're like, hey, I got my uh, blue light protecting glasses from online. And I'm like, well, do you know what wavelengths they're actually protecting or blocking out? I mean, you have to realize that what we're using are solid products and we're blocking out the right blue light. Um, you know, there's good and bad blue light. So you want to make sure you have the right option. So that's a good conversation starter for me. And folks are like, oh, wow, you do, you know, know what you're talking about. You have the right products. I shouldn't just be buying something random online because I don't know what I'm truly buying. So that's what I use whenever I'm having dialogue with my patients when it comes to talking about, you know, blue light protection and the different wavelengths and things of that nature as well. Well, Dr. Temple, I want to pick your brain on this topic because I think many optometrists, either in the UK or here in the United States, have been a little bit scared off at discussing some of these blue light topics because of some of the backlash we've seen in governmental agencies. So um, there was a big story back in 2017 where Boots Optical in the United Kingdom was fined 40,000 pounds for advertising that they had blue light filtering glasses that would prevent retinal damage um, to the cells in the back of the eye. So when we've got these governmental bodies going after eye care providers talking about blue light protection and discrediting the science, what should doctors be doing to help better educate our patients, but without um, confusing the situation more when you've got these other agencies saying, hey, blue light isn't damaging retinal cells? Yeah, that's a, it's a really uh, delicate area. And I think a lot of it comes from what I would call an overreaction or a backlash by the governing bodies, uh, primarily in the UK, and I, I'm not, I can't speak to other places quite so much. But when I've searched around, they've made, they've created what they call their blue light statements. And to be, to be perfectly honest, they're actually untrue. They've got it wrong, um, and and it's very misleading because what they're saying is point blank, blue light is not dangerous. And I can tell you right now. There are, there's 50 years of research that clearly shows again and again and again that blue light is dangerous. In fact, 433 nanometers in the blue is 20 times more damaging to retinal cells than 500 nanometer light. So this is, you know, th these are well established and the ISO is basing their curves um, for retinal hazard based on years of research. And, and those curves are actually being applied to the ophthalmic instruments that these optometrists and governing bodies are approving for use. So they clearly state that if you take a lens and cornea off, you can't be exposing the retina to wavelengths between well, the ultraviolet and all the way up to 500 nanometers. You need to really control how much light goes in. But what, what can we do in this space? So what have they done that's wrong? These governing bodies have, have 
kind of used blue light synonymously with digital light. And I think that's where the confusion comes in, because I, as I said earlier, admit that right now the jury's still out as to what the long term impact of digitally created blue light will have. But that's not the same because blue light is blue light in general. It's from the sun. It's from LED bulbs. It's from fluorescent bulbs and from your digital devices. And irrespective of where it comes from, it's still accumulating damage. And so that's the key. Blue light is dangerous, and anyone who says otherwise is wrong, 100% wrong. Whether digital devices and whether advertising that you're protecting some from digital devices, that's, I'd say the jury's still out. It's not clear. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because it's about exposure. So if you're going for a walk every day in the sun and you're doing down the beach and you're getting some sunlight in your eyes, and then you're going to work and working on a computer for 12 hours, and then you're looking at your phone and watching TV and you've got LED lights in your house, all of those things are releasing blue light in that range and the sort of 450, 460 nanometers and below, and it's all accumulating and causing damage. So we do need to be taking actions. We do need to be cautious and preventative. Uh, and doing things to reduce that blue light uh, entering our eyes. So to be honest, I think they're on thin ice. I think that at any time someone can come back and actually sue some of these governing bodies by saying, hang on a second, you said blue light wasn't dangerous. And now, you know, I've been using blue light and suddenly I've got AMD. And, you know, it, people didn't recommend I had blue blocking IOLs, for example, that I didn't um, put blue filters on my lenses, that I didn't look out for the LED lights that I'm buying at the corner store and then inappropriately using. Because the... The standards set on things like LED light bulbs are based on short-term high-intensity exposure, almost always in animals. And that's a different story. It's a different type of damage. It's not the kind of damage that accumulates through time. It happens there as well, but that's not what they're measuring. And so those standards for how intense an LED bulb can be that you put you know, anybody can just buy and put on their table um, are set for a very different purpose. And, and that doesn't mean we know what's going to happen in the long term. So a fantastic report came out April of this year from the ANSYS, which is the French Health and Safety Authority. And they clearly stated that actually, there's no question that blue lights link to age-related macular degeneration. And we need to be much more cautious about our LED bulbs, for example, because they're set to standards that don't apply to long-term exposure. You know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, it's going to be interesting. Do you know what's <laughs> funny? Because uh, people often ask me about this whole thing about what the governing bodies are doing and do we have enough evidence? And if you go back into what they did with smoking, for example, um, everyone today accepts that smoking causes lung cancer. But pre-1964, when the U.S. Surgeon General put out a report stating that smoking causes cancer, it was still up in the air, just like blue light is today. There was all sorts of debates. Both sides were arguing. Everyone was, was pushing around and fighting. And obviously, there were some big stakeholders involved, the tobacco industry. But the evidence that the U.S. Surgeon General had to put forward to make his claims um, were exactly the same evidence we have today for blue light. They were epidemiological studies, and they were animal-based studies. There has never been a double-blind placebo-controlled study in humans to prove that smoking causes cancer, and nor should there be, uh, nor will there ever be one for blue light in humans causing age-related macular degeneration. So what can we do? What evidence do we have? And is it, is it strong enough to start to make uh, informed decisions and start to take preventative action? And I think the key is the types of actions you have to take. It's not like you have to go out and get some kind of crazy injection or take some horrible drug every day to protect yourself from blue light. It's simple little things you can do to protect your eyes from blue light. Uh, I mean, I think that comparison is so telling just to think about uh, so many doctors think, well, like, well, we're just going to need to have science in humans with device use, looking at macular degeneration. And as you've made it very clear today, those kind of studies aren't feasible. They don't make any sense and could never be placebo controlled and have accurate data. And we have not needed those studies to prove other health hazards in the past because we have science that shows that exposure does create toxicity. And it's really, honestly, it's changing my mindset on how actively I'm going to be discussing and prescribing things in my office instead of waiting for some sort of research on humans that just feasibly will not be forthcoming. I agree, Jen. So Dr. Shelby, if there's one study that you could actually recommend for us to talk to our patients about, especially for those that want to know more about evidence-based medicine, what study do you recommend for us to educate our patients about when it comes to blue light protection? Uh, well, there's actually, there's probably two. Okay. Um, for humans, one's the uh, European eye study that was done by uh, Fletcher et al. in 2008, uh, which is often misquoted. It talks about uh, blue light in to the entire population. And when they do that, they show that 
there's a significant increase in risk of, of retinal damage. Uh, but it wasn't, sorry, there was, a, there was an increase, but it wasn't significant across all people. But in those people who had a poor diet and therefore had low levels of uh, carotenoids, so lutein, zeaxanthin, vitamin C, um, those people, the lower 25, 30%, those people had a much higher risk of age-related macular degeneration. So that kind of ties in this idea that our natural protection plays into how um, dangerous blue light can be to your retina. And then what's lovely is a, a sort of a long-term study that's been done now in macaque monkeys. Um, this is lovely work by Martha Nerger's group. Uh, they've been doing research on macaques for years and years. And uh, I'm not sure how long ago, but they did a 28-year study and they reported it uh, in Cambridge in 2018 uh, at a conference. And, and what they showed was that they took the, the adults, the mothers, and they took the population divided into two. And they, they completely starved one population of carotenoids. So they didn't get any lutein or zeaxanthin, these macular pigments, into the retina. And the other group got a normal diet. And then they raised their babies through life and looked at the accumulation of Jerusalem. Uh, and which is, of course, the, you know, the first signs of age-related macular degeneration. But these monkeys don't live long enough to get that. Uh, but they followed them for 28 years. And what they found was that those monkeys that had no macular pigments, no lutein or zeaxanthin uh, in their retina, um, got age-related macular degeneration at half the age of those that had normal retina with this blue light filtering, this natural blue light filtering in place. Um, and so that's really strong evidence for two things. One, that blue light is dangerous. Um, because that's, you know, it's getting through to this retina and causing the retinal damage. And two, that these macular pigments are so important uh, to protecting the retina, probably in two ways. One is blocking that blue light, but also uh, acting as antioxidants to help uh, re correct or, or get rid of the reactive oxygen species, the free radicals that are formed by blue light and start to damage the retina. So I would say those two studies are areas where I find you know, it's really clear, you know, there's, there are hundreds of studies out there and I, and I continue to read into them, but those are the two that I probably go back to the most uh, because they really do give you strong evidence. There's one other little one that I'll mention in passing, uh, Vijokinovic, I can't remember the name very well, but Croatian group uh, did some research where they, they went to a monastery, a Benedictine monastery, and they looked at the sisters there and they, he was examining their eyes. He was called in as, as an eye care profession to look at their eyes. And he looked at, I believe it was 13 of these sisters. And he reports that almost all of them had the retinas of like a baby. Uh, they were in perfect shape, despite their ages being up into their like 78. Um, and it turned out when he looked at their environment, they lived in this very dark monastery and they rarely went outside and all the windows were covered. And what this sort of reiterated was the fact that light is clearly the cause of retinal degeneration. But two of the sisters already had early signs of AMD. And he was confused and he sort of questioned them a bit and discovered that those two women were the ones that did all the gardening for the monastery. So spent most of their days outdoors in bright sunlight. And there was this classic, there was a controlled experiment that you know, he couldn't set up, but it was done already. And it, you know, these people are eating the same foods, living in the same house, doing the same things. But the ones that were outside got AMD and the ones that were inside had the retinas of a baby. So these are really striking, striking studies. Well, thank you so much for sharing that information. We're going to be linking all of those studies in our companion article. So you guys can click over and read more. But just fascinating work that's been done on this topic. So Dr. Temple, for those that want to learn more about what you have going on, what's the best contact information or best social media handles or email address for them to contact you? Um, yeah, they can look me up at zooloptics.com. We've got some videos on there uh, in this space around blue light protection and, and macular pigments uh, and more than welcome to drop us and uh, we've got info at azuloptics.com they can drop us an email and I'll happily uh, answer questions more specifically uh, it's a really interesting topic that I'm quite passionate about I'm sure that came across uh, I, I really do want people to do more uh, to protect themselves they, they, people shouldn't have to suffer with these diseases later in life and I also want to co-sign on your videos I mean that's how I came across you I was on LinkedIn and I saw your video in a way that you broke down everything and explained everything I was just a fan from day one so you guys make sure you check out that website learn more Let's do more. We are eye care professionals. This is our job uh, to make a big difference in, in today's society. Okay, it's a wrap. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to hang out with Defocus Media. We hope something resonated with you today. Please subscribe to our podcast and remember, we keep it 2020 around here. Pun intended. We look forward to seeing you next time.